Hello, welcome to my session on running low latency workloads on top of Kubernetes. Uh, an alternative title of this talk is how we run SpiceDB without hiccups. Um, <clears throat> this is going to be documenting largely our journey as we've kind of learned to run our latency sensitive workloads on top of Kubernetes um, uh, and kind of kind of guide you along your journey as well um, and show you kind of the primitives we use in Kubernetes to guarantee the performance that we need out of our systems. Um, so without further ado, um, we're going to need to go through some introductions. I am Jimmy Zielinski, so I am a co-founder of a company called AuthZ. Previously, I worked at Red Hat and CoreOS. I've been in all kinds of roles, um, product management, engineering, um, operations as well. I've been SRE. So despite kind of my current title as chief product officer, I still carry a pager. I still build uh, the systems that then get ran in production. Um, I've been around in the cloud native ecosystem for a pretty long time, basically since the beginning, um, because I started at CoreOS before Kubernetes or the Cloud Native Foundation was actually created. Um, <clears throat> so in that time, I worked a lot on kind of the container ecosystem. Um, so think about Docker registries. Um, I worked on Quay, which is the first private Docker registry. Um, I worked on Claire, which is the first uh, container static analysis tool for detecting vulnerabilities. Um, I am currently a maintainer of the Open Container Initiative. So that is the standards body that dictates what an application container is. Um, <clears throat> while I was at Red Hat uh, and CoreOS, um, I worked on basically what ultimately became the operator framework, which is a CNCF project now um, to help folks build and run operators on clusters. Um, and then in general, you'll probably have seen me on random GitHub issues around the cloud native ecosystem. Uh, I've never been a maintainer of Kubernetes or anything that hands on, but I've been a user its whole existence and chime in fairly regularly on different issues that I've hit in production personally. Um, prior to all this stuff, I was actually working on like the BitTorrent ecosystem. So I'm the author of some of the BitTorrent standards and I worked on a project called Chahaya which is a BitTorrent tracker, but it is actually part of the orchestration layer at Facebook internally um, that distributes their software uh, server-side from, from rack to rack. Um, so that was kind of like where I first began cutting my teeth on high performance and low latency Go systems. Um, and that will become relevant a little bit further on. Um, I figured I would add some of my contact information here just in case folks wanted to come back. Um, if you do want to reach out to me at any point in time, any questions at all, like related to this or anything that you can kind of uh, think of. Um, email is my best option. Um, you can also see me on like the social networks or GitHub. Um, but basically, if you want to get a guaranteed response, you want me to see something, email is definitely the, uh, the best venue for that. All right. Um, so next up <clears throat> is an introduction for SpiceDB. Um, SpiceDB is an authorization specific database. So it's a database that stores authorization data. Um, so authorization data is the data that you use in order to determine whether someone has uh, permission to perform a particular operation. Um, the reason why you would uh, usually want to kind of isolate all this stuff is so that um, <clears throat> you kind of have this centralized place where you have both the logic and data required to determine these permissions, that uh, empowers you a lot. Um, it means if you have multiple applications or multiple, um, multiple applications implemented in different languages, um, all of those different programs can actually just query this one central system um, to perform an operation um, to understand whether or not someone has access. Um, and so that means you're not writing uh, tons of different logic, uh, security critical logic um, in your code, duplicating it or like trying to make sure everything works everywhere. Um, and uh, we basically give you a framework for describing these systems in a safe way. So that guarantees that, oh, adding a new feature that needs to change the model, um, we can actually test that and guarantee to you that you have an openness security flaw uh, in your software. Um, and then also, we give you kind of uh, scalability guarantees. So as long as you build within this model, we can guarantee performance at a very high scale. That uh, not only means that um, you don't have to worry if you're like a massive company doing tons of traffic, but also that means that you can get um, very, very fine grain with the actual permissions you're allowing. You can ask um, very, very specific questions like, 
can this particular API key access this row in this other database? Um, <clears throat> so that, if you think about the order of magnitude for API keys, it's um, a multiple of the number of users on your system. If you think about the, the uh, cardinality of uh, rows in your database, it's also astronomically large. Um, so this system can scale to the cross product of that, just absolutely massive numbers. Um, in a way that the, the performance is predictable and always the same and low latency. Um, so those are kind of the high level reasons why you'd adopt something like this. Um, permission checks are super critical uh, because as I kind of said earlier, before you can do any work whatsoever, you first have to run a permission check. So that means that we're kind of in the critical path of absolutely everything. And before our folks even kind of make queries to their relational database, their primary data stores, this is a full request that has to happen at the exact same time or ahead of time. Um, that puts us super in the critical path. Um, thankfully, we are uh, the most mature uh, solution outside of Google that is inspired by the system that Google uses at scale. Um, that software is called Zanzibar. Um, it's not available to anyone else. And um, we have basically taken the, um, the idea behind that and made it kind of approachable to folks that are not inside of Google. Um, it's kind of well understood that Google has Googleisms. They have all of their own internal software that they can rely on. Um, the environment working inside of Google is not the same as working outside of Google at uh, another business, an enterprise software company. Um, you're not gonna have a lot of the availability and standardization around the tools that they use. Um, <clears throat> so instead, uh, we have designed an open source system that uh, works around all these things and is very friendly towards um, kind of folks that live in the real world and don't have access and the same guarantees that the software engineers operating inside of Google have. Um, so that often means we have to give people really nice uh, developer tools for integrating their products rather than um, having to be able, basically having a manager top down say, you're forced to use this solution. Um, so we have to entice developers with better tooling um, and better workflows than what they currently already have. Um, and just to kind of prove it all out, we've recently run benchmarks and um, hit five milliseconds at the 95th percentile, um, running a million QPS with 100 billion relationships stored inside of SpiceDB. So I think it goes out saying that um, we have built a low latency system that can check permissions largely at Google scale. All right. Um, <clears throat> so given my background, uh, given my co-founders' backgrounds, um, I think it goes kind of without saying that uh, our business is going to run SpiceDB on Kubernetes. It's, it's everything we have experience with operationalizing. Um, it's the thing we know super in depth. Um, and I have actually given another webinar where I kind of outlined how we deploy a database as a service as a high level um, on top of Kubernetes. That includes kind of like the workflows and a lot of the product requirements that folks often forget. Um, but also talks about how we lay out clusters, how we subdivide them, um, how we manage rolling out different phases of stability to different users. Um, this is very, very high level, um, <clears throat> but also talks about a lot of the core technologies we use. So if you're interested in kind of like the overall details of how one of these systems works, I encourage you to uh, check out this talk. You can find the URL right there. Um, <clears throat> but this journey wasn't easy, um, and running SpiceDB optimally on top of Kubernetes was non-trivial. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about why that is the case. So uh, SpiceDB, in order to get its low latency and very, very um, like quick answers for folks, uh, is massively parallel. Um, so what actually happens is SpiceDB is Kubernetes aware when you deploy uh, a deployment of SpiceDB on top of Kubernetes, it knows how to talk to the API server to discover pods in that same deployment. And it will um, then immediately connect to those pods and start self-clustering. <clears throat> so um, what is the point of self-clustering? Well, what actually happens is as requests come in, they come into a load balancer like Envoy, um, as soon as they hit any of the existing SpiceDB pods, um, that pod will break down that request into a bunch of sub requests that are then um, parallelized and sharded across the entire cluster. Um, <clears throat> so we use consistent hash ring in order to decide 
um, where a request should belong. And what that actually helps us do is it means um, caching for that particular um, answer, like that particular sub request will uh, be far more likely to exist on that particular pod. Um, so that basically gives us um, higher cache hit rates. Um, <clears throat> but then at the same time, because we're doing so much of this um, and we're kind of like recursively breaking down these requests into more and more sub requests that get parallelized, um, we are just trying to get as much throughput as possible um, and doing as much work in parallel as possible. So we're high users of um, Go's MNN threading models. So that means we spent up tons of Go routines as much as possible within process is also made parallel, not just across the server. Um, and all of this will become um, relevant way later in the conversation when we start talking about um, kind of performance implications once we've tightened a, a lot of the uh, scheduler down <clears throat> inside of Kubernetes. Um, but we have to start from the very beginning. So in the beginning, when you go to deploy your software on top of Kubernetes, there are the defaults. So what do the defaults give you? I have this title, are you even trying? And that's not talking about the Kubernetes developers or anything like that. That's about you. Are you actually trying um, if you've just kind of deployed your software and you haven't really done anything else? Um, the guarantees that Kubernetes gives you by default is effectively just best effort. Um, so the two real big points that I want to highlight uh, for uh, this kind of best effort behavior is that um, by default, there's absolutely no protection from consuming all of the memory on a node. That means um, there's nothing that stops an individual pod from just allocating more and more and more memory until the node has none, um, in which case you get an out of memory error and something has to be killed on um, that node. Um, so effectively then Kubernetes is going to have to like move a pod and switch it to another node. Um, but that disruption is still going to take place. Um, <clears throat> there's nothing that prevents uh, a, uh, like basically background job, a less critical job from affecting a performance critical job. Um, just because it has a memory leak, it can totally disrupt um, disrupt your performance of your very, very sensitive and critical workload. Um, so that that's like probably uh, number one, the biggest thing to look out for if you're just using Kubernetes defaults. Um, <clears throat> and then next up, uh, basically, uh, kind of like I just said, where, um, you can have kind of non-critical workloads scheduled onto the same uh, node as a critical workload. Yep, Kubernetes is gonna do its best to schedule workloads on different nodes. So it doesn't wanna put two of the same kind of pod next to each other. But like I said, <clears throat> everything is best effort. If it can't find space in the cluster, it's going to do that. It's not gonna throw an error. It's not gonna tell you that you need to provision more resources. It's just going to tell you, hey, it's, it's not going to tell you anything. It's just going to schedule the two workloads next to each other. If they're both latency sensitive, um, they might actually then um, have uh, performance implications on each other. So at the end of the day, there really isn't anything that Kubernetes is doing to prevent um, the quote unquote noisy neighbor problem um, and having like one pod affect another pod. And you have absolutely no guarantees of which pods land where. Um, so why don't we see what's available to us uh, to help the schedule and decide which pods should land where. <clears throat> so there's actually kind of two major primitives we're going to explore for giving the uh, Kubernetes scheduler more details. And the first one does exactly what I just described. Um, and this is called Tates and Tolerations. Um, the general um, kind of distributed systems uh, concept for this is called affinity and anti-affinity. So you might see that uh, referenced if you're reading any material that's not about Kubernetes that's still talking about this general subject. Um, but at the end of the day, um, there basically taints and tolerations are two special kind of um, labels, I would describe them as, that um, basically uh, a taint um, labels a node and says you cannot schedule pods unless they can tolerate this, this taint. Um, and then a toleration is a um, basically a label on a pod that says, I can actually tolerate this taint on a node. Um, and so you can use this to achieve certain things like only one pod can run on one node um, uh, of a particular deployment type. Um, 
And you can also extend it to go one step further, which is you can create a whole custom node pool um, that's specifically optimized for your workload. So in our case, what we did is we got very excited um, and then set a like SpiceDB specific um, taint and toleration and spun up a node pool um, that was the only thing that had that taint on it. Um, and that hardware could be optimized for running SpiceDB specifically. Like I said, um, SpiceDB is very, very parallel. So having more cores does a lot more for SpiceDB um, than maybe your general purpose um, instance types within Kubernetes. So um, this gives you a bit better guarantees, but there still isn't, um, unless you finally start using anti-affinity as well, um, which would prevent basically you from scheduling on anything else. Um, then you can start to make these guarantees that um, your nodes are, or sorry, your pods are only going to run on the very, very specific nodes that you've provisioned. Um, at this point in time, we did notice performance improvements on SpiceDB, but largely this is because of the optimized hardware we were running it on. And it was kind of a side effect of uh, having like nothing else run on these nodes, um, purely SpiceDB. Um, <clears throat> all right. So the next thing that you wanted to try that is um, kind of recommended all throughout the Kubernetes documentation is requests and limits. Um, requests are basically the ability for you to specify what resources need to be available on a pod for a pod to be scheduled. Um, you can kind of think of this also as like a, an affinity, anti-affinity kind of thing, um, except it's kind of aware of the actual resourcing uh, primitives like that the node has available to it. So it's a little bit more dynamic. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, limits actually create a hard limit um, for the pod. It says this pod, if it starts to grow um, in CPU or memory, um, like we're going to actually prevent it from ever growing past a certain point. So that kind of gives you guarantees for how you can kind of um, fit um, these pods onto nodes in a way that they're not going to overextend and impact, uh, start consuming some of the resources that another pod guarantees. Um, so that's fantastic. That's our sil sil ah, silver bullet, right? Like we're totally done. Um, basically between these two things, we have tons of guarantees now, right? Um, well, there's actually a bunch of pros and cons uh, related to adopting these two bits of uh, kind of well, uh, well recommended uh, configuration for Kubernetes. Um, on the pro side, we totally eliminated out of memory errors. Um, we're not gonna see those ever because uh, we have restricted the amount of memory that a pod can, can provision. Um, that's fantastic. And we've also guaranteed that the scheduler is gonna look for machines that have memory available before it schedules something that we know is going to grow. Um, you're going to have to ten, uh, basically spend some time while you kind of run your system without these limits. Um, to understand how it's consuming memory and where you want that threshold to be um, to safely run your software. But after that kind of like uh, initial configuration phase, you you have a good understanding of how to operate, operationalize your software, you should be totally fine. Um, and then the limits uh, actually make performance very, very predictable. You know, you're not gonna have anything uh, spiky um, and nothing is gonna go uh, totally awry. Um, but on the con side, uh, actually, these limits uh, artificially limit your processing. If you have available um, cores, uh, basically you're going to want to use that. If there's nothing consuming that, like if you have to burst, ideally you would still be able to burst. So that's kind of a limiting factor. Um, and then additionally, we just generally saw that merely enabling these limits, um, we saw a drop in performance. Um, I'm not sure uh, directly what the overhead is uh, with regards to that. But um, just tightening these things up uh, actually made things more predictable, but also had a performance cost. So that's kind of like a trade-off. You might be, you might ultimately decide that that's actually fine to like lose some of that efficiency, but ultimately um, gain that predictability. Um, the other super important thing to note about limits specifically is that they're reactive. There is actually a uh, API server flag where you can control the rate at which um, limits pull. And what happens is it's going to pull at that specific rate. Um, and when it detects that a pod has exceeded its limit um, during one of those pulls, then that's when it's going to react and kind of throttle that pod back um, or, or kill that pod. Um, <clears throat> so uh, 
that means that there is fundamentally this reaction time, um, like it is reactive and not proactive at preventing these bursts. So you can still burst outside of your limit, um, very much so enough to impact the uh, performance of a um, very low latency system. So there's kind of this uh, like battle between the latency that your software has and then the latency at which um, this polling rate can actually react. Um, and I think that you'll find that for specifically low latency systems, um, it doesn't matter. There, there's like a bottom basically limit for uh, how often you can set this polling rate. And um, fundamentally, it's, it's probably never going to be low enough. Um, and actually what we do need is a proactive solution rather than a reactive solution. Um, and then we kind of included this last bullet here, which is uh, there's still going to be context switching costs. So the scheduler can still move things around, um, like stop you from what you're currently doing, switch out. Um, and uh, because the processor is not necessarily guaranteed, um, you're going to be running on different cores on the same machine. So um, you can actually still have other um, processes running, like other pods, impacting the CPU performance of your, your software. Um, but what exactly is context switching? Um, you might not have a background in this and why that's important. Um, context switching is, number one, it's a really expensive thing um, that your, your operating system and schedulers generally do. Um, to understand it, basically, there's the, these kind of two concepts that a lot of people often conflate, um, concurrency and parallelism. And so parallelism is actually when you have two different processes and they're running completely um, separate tasks um, entirely independently. Um, so uh, that means that basically um, these are two completely, they can, they can, the workloads cannot affect each other um, because you actually have two workers fundamentally um, running two different jobs. Um, <clears throat> but concurrency is actually what um, you'll see in a lot of systems um, Specifically, uh, modern computers do both concurrency and parallelism, but if you're running on a single core machine, for example, um, you can still run multiple programs. Like a very uh, long time ago, um, computers could only run one program at the same time, and they got fast enough that they could do um, what's called multitasking. And multitasking is concurrency. Basically, it runs one program for a short amount of time, and then it swaps to running another program for a short amount of time, and then it swaps back to running another program for another short amount of time. And these swaps, while well, where it is actually like uh, stopping the execution of a program, kind of saving the current state of the world, re uh, restoring the state of the world of another program, and then continuing to execute that second program, um, that process is called a context switch. Um, Sorry, that's a cuckoo clock. Um, and so context switches are super expensive. Um, and if we look on a very, very deep level at like your, your processor, the actual CPU executing this code, um, <clears throat> it actually has to do a lot of work. It has to um, basically save those contexts and restore the context. But um, what ends up happening too is that um, Basically, the CPU cache, like a lot of the um, memory that's inside the CPU optimizing um, the throughput of the CPU is going to be invalidated because now it's working with completely different memory. It's working on a completely different problem. Um, a lot of the uh, predictions that you would get, uh, uh, a lot of your performance on your CPU, um, like a lot of that information just has to be completely cleared as it swaps to the next thing. Um, and not only is it kind of like at the uh, very much so hardware level, but at the like higher level, the scheduler that's managing um, swapping between these things, that has to do a, a bunch of bookkeeping around it. Um, oftentimes there's kind of rules around how things should be scheduled to get fairness. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that kind of leads into the two different kinds of scheduling. There's cooperative and preemptive scheduling. Um, cooperative scheduling is uh, typically when um, the systems, the two processes are working in tandem with each other. So um, you only yield to run another thing once you've um, basically gotten to a stopping point and you say, hey, okay, scheduler, I'm actually ready to be paused here. This is a safe place for me to be paused. And then you can run um, some other work. Um, and basically uh, by providing that signal, that's cooperating with the overall system. Um, this 
is a, a pretty common system, um, but it does have trade-offs. Um, you can have basically uh, processes that never yield or are very aggressive about not yielding to another process and uh, consume as much time as they want. Um, so that way you can actually starve out other processes. And this is really where you start to see um, uh, kind of like the quote unquote fairness of the scheduler um, being uh, invalidated. And you start to see performance implications on processes that are not actually getting the time that they need scheduled. Um, and then the other one, uh, which I, my head is actually blocking a little bit here is preemptive scheduling. So this is actually uh, triggered basically at any time. Um, so that means the context which any point in time, uh, the overall scheduler can say, okay, I'm done running this. I'm gonna pause it for a second and then swap over to another thing. Um, these systems have to be uh, designed to be robust and kind of like aware of the fact that they can get preempted at any time. Um, but it does get a little bit more control over uh, basically guarantees around fair scheduling. Um, so all that aside, uh, the question becomes, um, how can I actually uh, deal with these context swaps? I don't want um, another process running on my node to affect my low latency system. Um, and it turns out there's actually one feature left in Kubernetes that's really critical to solving this exact problem. Um, it's actually not one that's talked about a lot and it's kind of more obscure. And so I think this is actually going to be uh, probably the thing that um, surprises most people or most people are unfamiliar with. Um, however, they may not have uh, arrived at a lot of the same conclusions we have for kind of like the trade-offs of adopting some of these other solutions. Um, and that is the static CPU manager policy. Um, so this was actually made stable in Kubernetes 1.26. Um, and what this does is it basically lets you, um, if you create a um, request and limit um, for a uh, pod, um, CPU and you do it uh, with this mode configured with static CPU management configured. Um, if you use whole numbers, like uh, dedicate a whole core, it actually will give uh, exclusive access to that process to that core. That means it's mapping it to a physical core um, and it's going to stay on that physical core. That means no one else is going to be able to use that physical core. It's not going to context switch um, another process onto that core. Um, so this actually gives you back a lot of those guarantees. You're not going to get um, nearly as much of kind of like the noisy neighbor problems because you actually have guaranteed hardware now. Um, there are like some kind of caveats to note with this. Um, you can't just allocate all of your cores uh, on a node as um, these exclusive cores because there are still processes running on the system outside of Kubernetes um, and the kubelet itself. So kind of these system resources need something uh, uh, basically to run on. And um, that's basically also provided as a flag and uh, you need to allocate at least one CPU for that. Um, but you can also allocate more by configuring it with that flag. Um, and then kind of like the major trade-off here is that like these whole number of integers, um, you can't schedule things smaller than that because that would be sharing a particular core and that just arrives right back at the, the whole problem of context switching and other processes running on that exact core. Um, so now you're kind of beholden to restricting your, um, your workloads to very, very specific numbers of cores um, and whole numbers of cores. Um, but this also has a major thing. Um, and its name gives it away, it's static, but we need dynamic. Users are gonna be provisioning um, clusters here and uh, we're not going to be able to, we need to react to that. We'll, we'll eventually run out of cores available and then, then what happens on our system? Um, so with that, there is kind of auto scaling functionality in Kubernetes. And this is what actually fills the gap. Um, we are big fans of uh, this AWS project, which is totally open source, and it is a Kubernetes node auto scaler called Carpenter. Um, the super cool thing with this is that it basically adds just-in-time capacity. So that means that um, <clears throat> we can fully leverage the static CPU mapping. Um, and when we create a uh, new pod that needs to be scheduled, Carpenter is going to look at the results of the Kubernetes scheduler and this Kubernetes scheduler is gonna say, I can't find a CPU to actually schedule this on. Um, and when it does, it's going to actually provision a new virtual machine on our cloud provider, um, like a new node 
um, that will have those cores available to them um, within the limits that we configure for the size of the cluster be scalable. Um, <clears throat> and then um, those uh, that that deployment of SpiceDB can have the cores allocated uh, directly for it. So this kind of gives us the flexibility of um, uh, expanding and contracting based on the workloads that we have scheduled, but also the actual full dedication of those cores to our workloads. And if we run out of these cores, we can provision more cores specifically dedicated just to this workload. Um, there are uh, there are different like kind of cross cloud. Um, alternatives to this. Uh, so if you're on Google Cloud, GKE has Autopilot. If you're on Azure, uh, the AKS has a cluster autoscaler. Um, the nice thing about uh, Carpenter is it's actually open source um, and it has the ability uh, for folks to implement backends. Eventually I expect Carpenter to be fully fleshed out and support um, both uh, GKE and uh, AKS. Um, and that would basically mean you have one um, kind of unified um, single way of kind of doing this auto scaling um, that's cloud agnostic uh, rather than um, kind of working with the specific APIs across the different cloud providers. So um, it's really nice. Um, EKS doesn't actually have a checkbox inside of Amazon for you to just enable auto scaling. So this is their uh, cloud solution. And I'm actually really glad that that's the case because eventually we're gonna get this um, neutral way of actually doing auto scaling across cloud. Um, so with that, um, that's been our journey. These are the super critical um, bits of Kubernetes that we think are vital to running low latency systems. Um, I'd like to give shout outs to our team uh, at Altsed, um, who are the folks that largely have discovered and like worked through this process. Um, Brad Eisen, Evan Cordell, and Victor. Um, basically, these folks are the ones that have um, provisioned the infrastructure, uh, measured the infrastructure, ran benchmarks, um, dove deep into Kubernetes to, to understand exactly how all these primitives are working so that we can understand the trade-offs. Um, there's also this very helpful Medium article that kind of uh, guided us at the very beginning of our journey. And it basically is um, talking about like how folks just need to learn um, the, the actual implications of these primitives and use them properly. Because um, I think folks often just look at resource requests and limits and um, kind of assume uh, that these things are going to work for them and they're very simple, um, but actually there's a lot of deep implications for adopting these, um, such as the performance hit that we saw just by enabling CPU limits. Um, so that uh, concludes this talk. Um, if you have any questions at all with regards to this topic, um, with regards to SpaceDB, um, <clears throat> just Kubernetes in general, um, feel free to reach out to me via email. Um, but then we also have a community Discord, um, and you can see that URL at the bottom of the contact as well. Um, this is primarily uh, the community that does development and uh, uses SpiceDB, but we also talk about generic distributed systems concepts, uh, running software on top of Kubernetes, um, operators, development on um, code that integrates deeply with Kubernetes, and then uh, obviously as SpiceDB is a low latency system, we're often working with folks um, running SpaceDB on their own hardware or cloud configurations um, and helping them kind of discover the primitives available to, uh, to them to optimize um, that experience running a uh, low latency system. Um, and with that, um, I'd like to thank you for watching um, and feel free to contact me at any point in time in the future. Thanks.